Good morning. Well, let's try again. Good morning. Yeah, I know you're there. I can see you. I felt so bad for the worms in the parking lot this morning, all covered up with snow. It was... So spring will come. Turns out uh, Puxatani Phil was not accurate in his projection. So that's all right. We'll get through it. Listen, uh, I know you're, you're very well aware we're involved in a, a project called Next. It's an expansion project because we actually believe that with God there's always a next. We think that's one of the most hopeful things that we can never understand. And so our church family is expanding and we're increasing our facility to accommodate that. Just wanted to keep you up to uh, speed on a transition that just happened this last uh, week. And that was our original architect, due to some staffing uh, issues that developed in their firm, uh, was not able to keep up to speed with our project. And so we uh, arranged for a handoff uh, to another firm. This represents a very slight delay. Uh, there will be a little bit of increased cost to us, but we had already planned for some uh, potential overruns, so we're still in process with that. So we're hopeful that uh, we're actually pretty close to on track uh, in terms of being able to break ground and uh, get into our expanded facilities. So just keep that in your prayers. Just wanted you to be aware that uh, uh, we're moving forward with that. Uh, this morning we are in uh, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and then it's going to spill over into Hebrews, the fifth chapter, and uh, we're going to talk this morning. Uh, once again, this is a very interesting uh, book in the uh, library called the Bible, and it is because it is actually a, a book that was written to people who were raised in Jewish tradition and steeped in Jewish scripture, and so there's a lot of references that the writer, when he gives them, he believes that the people he are reading this, they get the reference and they understand the context. And for us who haven't been raised in that culture, it feels a little disjointed. So part of what we're doing in the study of this series is to go back and identify the context and what it actually means. In uh, beginning in verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace, throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. That is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, and there's a quote from uh, Psalm 2, and this is also something that was spoken at Jesus' baptism. You are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, and this is a reference to a prophetic word that King David had given in Psalm 110, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So we're introduced to a name and uh, what's interesting about this name is how rare it is in Scripture. We only have one instance where Melchizedek appears in Scripture. It's in Genesis chapter 14. And then there's only one other reference in the entire Old Testament, and that's Psalm 110. And so the question is, why is he throwing this guy into the mix to help us understand what Jesus is and uh, who Jesus is and what he is doing in our lives? 
So let's, uh, the, let's go back to this context of Melchizedek. The reason we are uh, introduced to this character is uh, what's going on in that region. And what had happened was is that there was a coalition, an alliance of nine kings. Uh, five are, of these were from the Jordanian area. Four of them were from the Mesopotamian era, area. And so they had this alliance. And this is something that kings would do. Kings weren't of... Uh, like of nations, the way we think of them today. They were more city-states. And they would create these alliances to further trade, to increase uh, their capacity to defend themselves. Just made a lot of sense. But the ones from Mesopotamia were actually more in control, and those four kings actually took tribute from the other five kings. And they did that for 12 years. It seemed to be, have been a decent arrangement, but after 12 years, the five kings decided they were not paying tribute anymore. They must have believed that they were strong enough both economically to survive that uh, without that connection. They also believed that they must have had enough military to defend themselves if these four kings wanted to come and challenge their right to not pay tribute. Well, they took that risk and they guessed wrong. Uh, the four kings came and they were cruel and they were ruthless and they were well trained and they had more military than the five kings had imagined. And they just ran roughshod through towns and villages. And they had a strategy to make sure that no one would be coming up from the behind of them in order to attack them. And along the way, they're just they're taking people as captives and they're taking treasure. They have this final collision with this army of the five kings, and it doesn't go well for the five kings. There's actually a reference to one point that the, some of the people, as they were fleeing, were hiding in tar pits so that they could get away. How many think that cannot be a good day when you're hiding in a tar pit? Yeah. And so that's how it was for them. One of the challenges was is that uh, one of the cities they just ran roughshod through was Sodom. And in Sodom, there was a man who lived there whose name was Lot. And Lot had an uncle. And Lot's uncle is Abram. And if you don't know how significant a person that is, he would later become known as Abraham. And if you don't think he's an important person, you haven't looked at a map recently and you haven't studied world religions. Uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all find their genesis in Abraham. There's no way you can say this guy doesn't matter in human history. It's just unbelievable how much influence he has had. And so his nephew was one of the people that were taking captives. And up to this point, Abram has no interest at all in getting involved in all of this fighting between kings. He doesn't own a city. Remember, he's something of a nomad. He's looking for a place that God wants to settle him in, but he's not there yet. And he has no children, but he is building his own personal empire. And so there are people, there are servants, that the Bible says 318 men born in his house. So these are people that he not only were raised to know him, but he trained them, and he trained them in all the things that they would need in order to continue to defend and expand the empire that he's building. And so when he finds out Lot has been taken captive, he decides he's going to go on a rescue mission, and he pulls his 318 men together, and they go out on this mission, and they march all night long. They take the uh, alliance of the four kings by surprise. They've already been involved in a significant battle. They're exhausted from that. On top of that, they're enjoying the spoils of victory. And they didn't expect that anyone was coming up from behind them. And so uh, uh, Abraham, or Abram actually divided his group into two sections. And they attacked from both sides. And it completely surprised this alliance of the four kings. And they took off running. And Abram spent days tracking them down. And when he was done, he got every person back and everything they stole. It was quite a mission. And on his way back, he's, going to, he's returning, he comes across this man named Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, we don't know hardly anything about him except his name and where he's from. We, we don't know his ethnicity. We don't know anything about this guy. But his name means Lord of Righteousness. Well, that's interesting. We also know that he is the king of Salem. That is the place that we would later know as Jerusalem. So, and Salem actually means peace. So he's a king of a city whose name is peace. 
His name is Lord of Righteousness. And he comes out, and when he sees Abram and this rescue mission that he's been engaged in, he blesses Abram in the name of the God Most High. Now, that's a very biblical reference. And he serves bread and wine to Abram and all the men. Does this sound like anybody to you? The, the king of righteousness who blesses in the name of God Most High and uses bread and wine to remind us of who he is and that it's something that nourishes and sustains us. I mean, it's just unbelievable, the connection between this guy and Jesus. And Abram is so overwhelmed. He's so grateful that this has gone well, and he's met a person like this, that he actually takes 10% of everything that he, that he was able to recover, and he just gives it to Melchizedek, king of Salem. So that's who this guy is. Now, what's interesting is that this guy holds two positions which you never see in Scripture. He is a king of Salem, kind of a city-state thing, but he's also a priest. He's offering blessings. And he's serving. And what you need to know is that in the ancient world, in the Old Testament, you don't see king priests. You see kings and you see priests because they have very different functions. Kings were responsible to represent God to people. That's their role. As best as they could discern, not all of them did it well, they would try to figure out what are the laws that God thinks are important. And I am going to impose them on this kingdom. And if anyone violates them, they're going to experience judgment and punishment. That's what the sword of the king was about. And so they represented God to people. Priests, on the other hand, represent people to God. And so they understand. In fact, there's a phrase that's used there. It says that they, they, they interact gently with people because they know that there are things that we don't know. We're ignorant and we have a tendency to wander. And so they offer gifts and sacrifice for the sins to address the weaknesses. And so for the first time, we see someone in Scripture in Genesis 14 who is a king representing God to people and a priest representing people to God. This is a very unusual picture. And once again, Abraham is so impressed that he just winds up uh, voluntarily giving to him 10% of what he had recovered. Now, what you need to know is that this is being written to Jewish people in the first century. And they had challenges with accepting Jesus as Messiah because they expected their Messiah to be a king. They thought that someone would come in, that they would form the kind of alliances that kings form, that they would raise up military might, that they would overthrow the Roman occupation, that they would restore the government of Israel, and they would bring back the glory of that former government and renew the nation as a whole. And it would be this wonderful season that not only would benefit the nation of Israel, but all the nations around it. So they were constantly looking for that king. And Jesus doesn't fit that mold. He, he's constantly doing priestly things. And so they had a hard time recognizing Jesus as Messiah. But even when they looked at the priestly things, they had a hard time recognizing him because he was not from the tribe of Levi. And this is a big deal uh, to Jewish people in, in the first century, that all of the priests came from one specific tribe, and that was the tribe of Levi. And Jesus wasn't from that tribe. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. So different tribe. So he's from the wrong tribe. And he's not acting like a king, so he must not be the Messiah. That's how they thought about it. Well, these Hebrews actually came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but they were second-guessing themselves because life was getting harder and harder, not easier and easier. And they were experiencing more persecution, not less persecution. And so they began to ask some very uh, deep questions, and they began to be suspicious of their own faith. And that's why this book is written to begin with. So the author of Hebrews wants, this is the point I want you to see, the author of Hebrews wants readers to see Jesus for who he is and not just who we want him to be. This is the thing, the challenge about Jesus. We're always trying to make him into the image and likeness that we prefer. 
And so if you're looking for a king, he didn't look much like a king. If you're looking for a priest, he comes from the wrong tribe. People are always trying to, to impose something on Jesus. And so what this author wants his readers to see, take a look at Jesus for who he is. He is not going to follow you. He's asked you to follow him. So as a priest, Jesus is a priest. As a priest, he's able to comfort us. He's able to comfort us. The scripture says that we can approach him with confidence and that when we do, we find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. I'm sure at some point in your life, maybe not every time, maybe not most of the time, but at some point in your life, you have gone to someone for help and you found grace and you found mercy and it was life to you. It, it helped you get through a difficult situation. He's approachable because he lived fully as human and he suffered and he was betrayed and he was abandoned and he was misunderstood. Jesus knows what it's like to live in this very real and broken world. And this is important for us. The writer of the, of, of the book of Hebrews wants his readers to understand that this is someone who understands what it's like to go through difficult and painful experiences. And he even makes reference to something that shows that he was familiar with the story of Gethsemane because he said, our high priest Jesus, he cried out with loud cries and many tears in his petitions to God. And he was actually, this happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was praying. He was scanning the will of God to see if there was any way that he could get Redemption brought to humanity without the cost of his life. And then he, he, he gets to this place where he surrenders his own will. He, he stops asking, is there any other way? And he starts saying, your will be done. I, I can tell you, if you've walked in faith very long, you eventually get to a place where your prayers change. A lot of times we think that God can only be real if the things we want to change happen. But sometimes some of the most real things get proven to us when we learn to change how we're praying and thinking about something. And so he, Jesus becomes a priest. And it says he's, he, all the priests are selected from the people. He's one of us. He's among the people. And he's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and wandering off. And every priest offers gifts and sacrifices. If you've ever been through a devastating experience in your life, something that just really was painful, and you try to explain it to people who haven't experienced it. You just can't find the words and you don't believe they understand. You just don't have the language to describe the depths of the pain or the anguish or the disappointment that you experience. But if you ever run into someone who's been through the same thing, there's just this connection that you experience. Now, the challenge is, is that sometimes we're trying to explain to someone, and they haven't been through the same thing, and they look at us and they go, oh, I know exactly what you're going through. And they don't. And it frustrates us. Them saying that doesn't make it true, and we can tell. We have a high priest who's been through it all. He suffered unspeakable loss. He bore unbearable pain. And when you talk to him, he already understands. He's been through it. So we have a high priest who is able to comfort us. But we also have a king who's able to confront us. Now some of us say, well, I'm not really interested in the king part. I'll just stick with the priest part. I want to be understood. I'm not interested in being challenged. But here's what we need to know. Empathy alone doesn't heal us. It helps. That's not the same thing. Sharing our pain makes us feel better. But making some changes can help us get better. And Jesus comes to do that too. There are changes that we need to make. There are steps that we need to take. So Jesus comforts, but he also confronts. So I just started thinking, you know, where does Jesus so, show evidence of this? And actually, there's a lot of stories in Scripture that give evidence of this. One of them is found in Luke chapter 10. This story is referred to in multiple Gospels, but the, 
the uh, uh, reading that I'm referring to is in Luke chapter 10, and there was a person who came to Jesus who had three things everyone wants to be. Right? He was rich. Lots of money. Secondly, he was young. Who wouldn't want to just take a couple years off right now and <laughs> dial the clock back? And, and, and he was a ruler. He had authority. He could make decisions. People respected him. He was a rich, young ruler. And he comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, good master, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And uh, the, the Bible uh, says that Jesus, first he says, is, why are you calling me good? There's only one good, and that's God in heaven. But then he starts referring to the commands. He says, well, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness or defraud people, honor your parents. And the young man looks at Jesus, and this is what he says. I have been doing this since I was a child. And then there's this really interesting phrase. It says, Jesus felt love for him. And as soon as I read that phrase, I go, oh, here comes priest Jesus. This is where he gets a pat on the back, an arm around the shoulder. This is where he gets a, you're good. You're in. Keep up the good work. But that's not what happens. Jesus goes all king on him. And this is what he says. There's one thing you're lacking, which surprises me. Because what I expect Jesus to say is, your problem is you have too much. You got too much of everything. And he doesn't. With all that he has, he says, there's one thing that you're still lacking. And I don't know what it was. I don't know if he was saying, you lack the capacity to be generous, or you lack the capacity to be, to be dependent. You don't know what it's like. Uh, you're, you're too independent. Uh, you lack the capacity to be humble. We don't know what Jesus was referring to. He didn't say. But he said, there's one thing you lack. And the way you're going to get that is if you take everything that you have and you sell it, and then you give that money to the poor, and you come follow me. This is King Jesus. And the Bible tells us what happens next. And this individual, this rich, young ruler, suddenly his countenance becomes sad. And the Bible said his heart was grieved, and he walked away. And that feels like failure to us. Some of us, some of us just want the understanding, comforting Jesus, but not the challenging, confronting Jesus. And the truth is, we need both. If you are only able to serve a God who always and completely agrees with you and only always approves of any choice that you make, then you are going to have to make a God in your own image and your own likeness, and I don't recommend it. We have been made in the image and likeness of God. Our, in our culture, we don't have words like this for priests and kings so much anymore. But I think there is a word that helps us capture what the mission of Jesus is in our lives. See, we do have a growing appreciation for counselors. Uh, this is what a good and true counselor does. They understand what you're going through. You can open up completely without fear of them rejecting you. But they also challenge some of your assumptions and your actions. They don't just listen, they also speak. And the goal of their conversation is not to demean you or to put you down. The goal is for you to get healthy and strong so that you can handle the challenges and the situations that you face. You see, Jesus won't choose between the ministry of tears or the ministry of truth. Jesus does both. And as it turns out, we need both. Now, there are some people, I'm sure you've run into them, they think they want King Jesus, and they're pretty sure they want him to do something today. Just bring judgment in full, let punishment fall on the people who deserve it. Justice needs to be enacted immediately. Bring out the sword, King Jesus. And that's because they think that if the sword falls, they'll be on the right side of that thing. They're pretty sure that they've lived good enough 
And here's the challenge. Scripture says that all of us, every single one of us, have something to account for in our life. Every single one of us have wandered. Every single one of us have made wrong choices. Every single one of us have taken wrong actions. And it doesn't stop there. The Bible also says every single one of us have done good things for bad reasons. And in God's view, that can be as destructive or even more destructive than the other sins. Because we did something that fed a dark part of our heart and we turn right around and feel good and better than others about it. It's unbelievably dangerous. And so for people who think they just want Jesus to take out the sword and let it fly, let's just be careful about that. And of course we want priest Jesus, always forgiving, always loving, always comforting, but... Jesus does all of that, but not only that. He's a counselor. He understands. He offers gifts and sacrifice for our sins. But he also challenges and he comforts. Because he knows in whose image we're made and what we can become. So if you choose Jesus, you get both priest and king. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, there's a lot of people who just what they've heard about God they're pretty sure that God is just angry at them all the time and they've never really taken a look at God in the flesh who who cries with us who listens to us who comforts because he understands he's been through it. He was betrayed. He was abandoned. He suffered unbelievable loss. And he gets it. And for some people in the room, you're just pretty sure God can't, that he's so far removed. And that's what Jesus does. That's why we need Jesus the priest. He's not far removed. He's walked where you've walked. And there's other of us, of us we're, we're a little bit concerned about Jesus, the king, speaking into our lives. We're suspicious. We think that God makes us do stuff we don't want to do and that it's just because he's capricious or because he has a hidden agenda. And God has no hidden agenda. He wants what's best for you forever. And he will never change his position about that. That's his desire. So he speaks into our lives. He calls us up and he calls us out. And if we're not willing to listen to that voice, it breaks his heart, not because we've rejected his counsel, but it breaks his heart because he knows we can't move forward and he knows what our possibilities are. So that they, are you willing to accept Jesus as priest who comforts and as king who confronts, because that is how we are understood and healed. Heavenly Father, help us accept you for who you are, not just the image we would like to impose on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.